Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. In the late 1990s, Oklahoma City expressed their thanks and gratitude to the community of fire chaplains that had responded to their community in the wake of the bombing of the Alfred Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City there. At the time, it was the largest act of domestic terrorism, 168 lives, 19 children killed. And for days, rescuers went in and brought out remains. Remains of those too young to have been killed. And so chaplains from all over the country had descended and worked in the telephone building across the street, uh, meeting one-on-one with each rescuer, trying to make sure that they were okay in the process. So they welcomed us back. We went, they entertained us some, but then they sought to share with us some of the story and the impact of the bombing and what it meant for us to be there. So they took us out to what had now become a grassy field. The new memorial had not been built. And we walked upon that grass. And just being in that place, I found chills running up and down my back. Then they took us down into the bowels of a building. They had set up a place where uh, they had gathered the mementos and makeshift memorials that people had left. And they shared those with us. They were saving them for the artists that were working on conceptions for the memorial. Pictures of children with teddy bears. What got to me the most was a number of posters that people had made wanting to do Uh, not believe that their loved ones had died but had been somewhere else. They had created Have You Seen posters. We saw those after 9-11 again. The sense of loss for that community, not only in the loss of life, but uh, in the impact that that disaster, that terrorism had on them. Now, as I've reflected on that, in fact, I started to go back and pull out some of the pictures I had, I realized it still got me a little bit too emotional to use for my preaching today. I thought about the things I've lost in life. Simple things like keys, the key fob for my car, that was an expensive thing, although I wasn't very sentimental. Tools, MP3 player, and I've certainly had people die in my life, but I have not experienced the kind of loss that the people in Oklahoma City or Newtown, Connecticut, or uh, even the victims of September 11th. As we come to these parables, they are parables about loss. A loss of a coin, a sheep, even an ungrateful child. But all of them seem to pale in the emotion that is experienced by those who have had those profound loss experiences You know, much of the emotional experience of Oklahoma City quickly resurfaced as I watched the towers fall and as I watched the news stories and saw similar posters coming up there and the too few reunions that took place. The text says that the Pharisees were grumbling and complaining because tax collectors, sinners, prostitutes, they were coming to Jesus And more specifically, they were upset because Jesus was receiving these people who were supposed to be outcasts. People who were to be shunned, who weren't to be eaten with, those you were not supposed to associate with. And in response to that grumbling comes these three parables. First, the parable of the lost sheep. A shepherd who discovers that one of his 100 sheep is missing and leaves the other 99 unattended to go in search of the one. Really? Uh, You risk 99 sheep who could be devoured by wolves for one? Maybe that's why this man was a shepherd and not a banker. Or what about the lost coin? A poor widow loses a coin and spends hours looking for it. She lights a lamp. She sweeps the house. Really? I suspect most of you gathered wouldn't stop to pick up a penny, much less waste more money on lamp oil than the coin is worth to find one lost coin. And then we get to the prodigal story. Notice, I don't want to call it the prodigal son. In fact, one of the things I would challenge you is 
if your Bible's got headings for all of the different accounts, cross them off and write your own. This is not a prodigal son story. It's a story of prodigals. And there we experience what seems to be more real to the life we know than the first two parables. And I'm not just talking about the wayward son being welcomed home. I mean, that does happen, perhaps not with the frequency we would like, but rather the reaction of the older brother who scoffs at his father's welcome of his younger brother. That doesn't just happen in Scripture. I mean, you nod your heads, right? Uh, That happens in real life. Now, the parables are told in response to how the Pharisees received what Jesus was doing. Jesus welcomed. He associated with, he fraternized with sinful ones who were supposed to be outcasts. The parables are Jesus' response to the Pharisees. A poor widow and a wealthy shepherd. Luke likes to offer the contrast time and time again. I hope you're catching that as we go through God's passionate story. By the way, uh, you think of shepherds as poor, but the average shepherd had about 10 to 15 sheep. So if this shepherd had 100 sheep, the shepherd was wealthy. There's no attribution by Jesus to their loss. In other words, they're not at fault for the loss. The sheep wandered off. The coin got uh, misplaced. It's interesting because many of those whom the Pharisees were ready to cast out or to make outcasts were not sinful by virtue of something that they had done by their will, but rather by circumstances. If your father was a shepherd, you became a shepherd. And shepherds were unclean because of their profession. They couldn't bathe. They they couldn't uh, observe the Sabbath because you just can't leave the sheep for one day a week. Or the prostitutes. Just like today, Most don't enter prostitution as a a willful decision. This is a great way to make a living. They do it because of their socioeconomic status and the need to eat. And Jesus responds with this example of rich and poor, male and female, and then says there is this unexceeding joy when those are brought back into the fold. Now, the parable of the sons. Now we get some volitional acts, right? I mean, the son comes to the father and says, give me my share of the inheritance. That, by the way, would be like saying, Dad, I wish you were dead. Give me my share now. The father gives it to him. He goes off and parties until the money's gone. And he finds himself down and out, and he returns. And when he returns... The father puts a robe, a ring, and sandals on him, kills the fatted calf, which of course is giving him what really belongs to his older brother. The older brother, who by the way stayed behind and worked and obeyed his father, was the good son. Do you notice in the story that the father is so excited when the younger son comes back that he forgets to invite the older son to the party? He leaves him working in the field, and when he comes back in, he discovers there's a party going on. And isn't this where the parable hits home? You know, the older brother, some would say, has wasted his life and work. He's so angry that when the father comes, because he doesn't go into the party, he doesn't even refer to his brother as his brother. He says, this son of yours, he's not my brother. Don't we know firsthand, time and time again, what it means to be treated unfairly? To be on the wrong end of, quote, justice? No, we experience it from very early on. In fact, we get all of these kind of pat, simple phrases. uh, Phrases that are so easy that an early reader could read them. That's mine. Or no fair. You know the story of the older brother. But perhaps, too, you've had a prodigal type of life 
And there's plenty of us gathered here in worship this day who might have found themselves uncomfortably returning home, asking for forgiveness, finding a robe put on our shoulders, a ring on our fingers, and sandals on our feet, and a fatted calf being slaughtered for a feast. While we feel the guilt of the choices we've made and the ready forgiveness. One of the problems with this parable is we get so caught up in this parable trying to figure out whether we are not, we're the son who's wandered off or we're the, the son that stayed behind and worked and are experiencing injustice that we miss the big picture. One of the joys about Luke is by putting all this together, we get a sense of that. You see, because I want you to catch what happens. Whether you're the irresponsible child who squanders the money or the resentful child, the father comes to bring you back into the house and to be part of the family, back into relationship. That's the key for understanding the first two parables. And that's tough for those of us who frame the world from a return on investment kind of worldview or a cost benefit analysis because you don't leave 99 sheep to look for one and you don't worry about one coin and spend more on lamp oil than the coin is worth. If you're talking about justice, you don't want to look at the third parable because you'll find yourself sulking with the, third, with the older brother. A sermon I heard from uh, Dr. Uh, Reverend Rafael Malpica Padilla. He's an ELCA pastor who leads our Division for Global Missions. Offered an insight to this text that was profound for me. So the problem is we keep focusing on the one sheep and on the one coin and on the prodigal son and we lose sight of the entire big picture. The issue isn't the one, it's the nine and the 99 because the 99 aren't complete unless there are 100 and the nine coins aren't complete unless there are 10 and the father doesn't have a family unless both sons are there. You see, God frantically searches for the lost God welcomes prodigals and coaxes older siblings back time and time again because that's what it takes for the kingdom to be complete. The Pharisees were ready to draw all kinds of lines. They were ready to build walls, build up fences, and say, you aren't welcome and they aren't welcome and this person can't come because they're clean and they're outcasts and they're sinners. And Jesus says, but wait. You're not complete without them. So, what does that mean for us? So often, we in the church, we who are faithful followers and lovers of Jesus, talk to those, talk and, and speak about those people who aren't yet in the community, and we call them the lost. What if they aren't the lost, but are what we need? To be complete. That's what this specific opportunity for inviting at Easter is all about. Even our concert the week after. Because we recognize that we aren't going to be made whole here. We aren't going to experience the real joy of the kingdom until everyone's had the opportunity to hear of God's incredible love and claim on their heart and lives. It isn't about reaching out to the lost so much as recognizing that we aren't complete without others being brought into the community itself. When you understand it that way, the -the over-the-top joy that's expressed by the shepherd and the woman makes absolute sense. You see, our God, who knows loss firsthand, not only stands with those who know profound loss, events like September 11th, Uh, Newtown, Connecticut, Oklahoma City, but even those who mourn the loss of anything, a loved one, a relationship, a dream. And God stands ready to bring, and God longs for reunion, renewal, and new life in this lifetime and into the next. So brothers and sisters in Christ, whether you are a lost coin, a lost sheep, a reckless sibling, a resentful sibling, or if you're the Pharisees who want to draw lines, 
God is seeking to bring you and everyone else into the kingdom. Where real joy is found in everyone being present and everyone having a place. And so this Lenten journey this year, as we journey to the cross, may you be open to the possibilities that the kingdom carries and that God envisions. Amen. I invite those who are able to stand as we pray. As the praise team comes forward. Lord God, we gather this day. A place filled with lost coins, lost sheep, resentful older siblings, crazy younger siblings, Pharisees. And we know that you seek each of us out, that you long to bring us together, and that your love pours out over our hearts and lives. Help us to be open to all those that you long to bring into the kingdom just as you have sought to bring us in as well. We pray in Jesus' name.